presentation yeah okay yeah yeah that's great yeah well thanks for all sticking with us uh today and and thank you very much uh alan for for hosting it and be the uh the uh, person at front of house today so thanks to nature spot i'd also like to thank um uh, kirsty and her contribution from the leicestershire and rutland environmental resource center because without those two organizations then i wouldn't be here today and be able to talk about um the data that i'm going to show you so uh quickly moving on because i'm conscious of time etc um i'm just going to go back through a few of the mammal records that we've got over uh, the last 60 years so so not long at all really going back to the 1960s and really up to round about sort of 1985 1986 we had very very few mammal records that were coming through um we've now got up to about 90,000 uh, mammal records and you could see that from um Kirsty's slides that actually it's still a relatively small proportion of the overall taxa that are recorded uh, and held at the record centre. What you can see from this particular slide, though, is that we've got um, a real increase in data happening from around 2000. And really, we need to put this down to an increase in technology. Um, I don't think any of the other speakers have mentioned the World Wide Web. But obviously, that has been a huge influence on how uh, we're more aware of, of um, the uh, species conservation, how we can record things. Certainly, the, the national organisations like the Mammal Society and the People's Trust for Endangered Species uh, play an, a terrific role in raising awareness for mammal conservation across um, the UK. So we shouldn't take that for granted. And as I say, the, the actual uh, connections, how we can connect to the World Wide Web um, are fantastic. You know, the speed in which we, we can change from uh, screen to screen and we no longer have to sit waiting for that, um, uh, that timer to, to go round and round and round. Um, a lot of us also obviously have mobile phones. We can readily take photographs and submit them to Nature Spot. We can uh, download apps and we can record stuff uh, at our fingertips. And this is having a huge effect, not only just on mammals, but but, but other taxon groups. And I know that some of the other speakers have alluded uh, to that this morning as well. I think citizen science is a big part, uh, certainly for mammal recording as well. And the number of people that are out there just uh, sending our records in uh, shouldn't go um, unnoticed either. So it's a combination of things that are really, really making a difference. And technology is one of those things. So with public engagement, certainly the mammal group have been wanting to get people to record mammals uh, across the VC55 area, across Leicestershire and Rutland. Um, and one of the things that the Mammal Group have been doing is encouraging experts and people who really have no experience at all in recording mammals to send their, their records in. So for the last couple of years, we've been running a mammal spotter competition. Um, and we run it during August when it's it's nice, it's, it's the school holidays, everybody should be out there uh, making the most of the weather. And um, for this year, we set ourselves a target of 500 species. And in actual fact, we, we, we got over 600 species recorded in one month. And in any one month, normally we get two or 300 species. So this is almost like doubling uh, the number of records for mammals that we get. Um, and the top scoring mammal was the common pipistrelle. And also otters were frequently recorded during that time. So it has been a, a very good, successful way of actually getting the public to, uh, to tell us what there is uh, recorded out there. And it's interestingly, although not recorded during the mammal spotter competition, we did get this uh, species in the uh, central photograph here reported to Nature Spot. So the fact is that Nature Spot is now well known, certainly in the local world of recording, as a, as a go to organisation. 
Um, if you see a species that's slightly unusual, who do you call? Well, you call nature spot. So this is a red squirrel, like most of you will have recognised. Um, but the unusual thing is it's been recorded in Bagworth, uh, Bagworth Heath area, about three or four months ago. This squirrel turned up. It is on a squirrel feeder, as you can see, so it might have been reintroduced. Um, but it's not something that the mammal group or any other of the conservation organisations were aware of. So we don't know how it's got here. And certainly from the mammal group's point of view, we wouldn't support such an introduction. Um, it's unlikely to be sustainable. And uh, unfortunately, if it comes into contact with a grey squirrel, it's likely to get the squirrel pox and then it will die. So for those reasons, we wouldn't support this. Um, interestingly, it appears to have turned up in Thornton in the last couple of months. It was seen running along somebody's back garden fence. So if you do live around that area, then do keep your eyes peeled and do let us know if you do see the red squirrel. So when we look at data a little bit more closely, uh, then what I've done is I've broken it down into various 10 year periods from 1992 up to last year. And you can see just how much the species data for mammals is increasing. And it does that year on year. Um, but obviously I didn't want to break it down into, into annual records. Um, what is clear is that when the species records came in in 1992, we were mainly concerned with badgers and bats. Uh, two protected species, the Protection of Badger Act came in in round about 1992. So unsurprisingly, there was an influx of badger records, probably from consultants having to do the surveys, but also from the badger group taking um, account of where the badgers were and, and it, that increased um, recognition that badgers were in danger and needed our help. Um, similarly with, with bats, the, the use of technology has really, really made a difference. Uh, the bat um, recording fraternity you have used technology for years and years and years. And um, many of us have got the handheld recorders. Um, now we use uh, static recorders, everything's coming down in price. Uh, there's even a phone app that you can download now and just attach a, um, a back recording app uh, just to uh, get your own local records. So technology is certainly playing a part. And when we look at the records that were um, taken just from 2022, and we've got nearly 7,000 records, the table on the right shows that actually most of those records are bats. Um, and these records were taken from the record center. Um, so they've got bats in various names. So obviously we've got common pipistrelle, soprano pipistrelle right at the top there, but then you've got pipistrelle a little bit further down at 104 species, um, and then slowly going down and down and down. Um, what is fairly obvious, though, is that when you look at the other mammal data, it's probably not very well represented. So say we've got moles and everybody goes around seeing mole hills. Um, we've got moles at 107, I think. Uh, we've got common shrew at 15. Um, we've got uh, harvest mice at three. So certainly our small mammals are being totally underrepresented when we're looking at our data. So when we're collecting all this data, and as I say, we've got around about 90,000 mammal records at the record centre. Is it is it a good thing that we're collecting all this data, but then it's not really showing us what direction um, the, the species are going in, whether they're increasing their range or whether they're in danger and and uh, they could be dying out in the local area. So I think really we need to look at how we are collecting that data and how we can make sense of it to, um, to actually inform on what, what we're doing is right or what we're doing is wrong. So uh, this is actually a little bit of a repeat of what, um, what uh, Tim has already uh, provided for us uh, and, and thank you very much. So I'll, I'll quickly skim over a little bit of this. But one of the things that uh, Tim, Tim, 
Tim did mention is about the use of longworth traps, which is a traditional way of monitoring small mammals. It's very time consuming. It's not very ethically um, well received because you're basically incarcerating a small mammal in a metal box that conducts heat or cold for a period of time. And along with that does come some fat fatalities. Um, as Tim also alluded to, that if you've got a lactating female or a, a female that's pregnant, then um, again, having that uh, animal in that box for that length of time isn't very good. So for a long time, uh, the researchers have been looking at methods and ways of um, really trying to establish presence or absence of small mammals and doing that in a much more friendly way and, and, and cost effective and time effective way. So for a while, we've been able to use the uh, normal camera traps. So you've, you've got me in the background there uh, putting one up. Um, they're great for recording large animals like badgers and foxes and deer, but very much less so for recording small mammals. The small mammals tend to be too fast um, they tend to be a blur when you look at them and you're trying to identify which species it is. So the box that uh, Tim showed in his photographs, we've got a very similar looking uh, box in the, the photograph on this screen. Um, the, box, uh, the camera is put at the back. Uh, the HD lens um, can simply be a pair of reading glasses, cheap reading glasses, even better. Uh, take one of the lenses out stick it on the um, the, the camera lens uh, with a bit of blue tack and um, Bob's your uncle. Uh, you're in business and you can start recording those, those mammals. So we've got an example here, um, actually provided again by Tim. So we've got his water shrew recorded at Rutland Water and also a uh, an otter having a look around the corner just to see uh, what's there. Um, on the left hand side, we've got a nice little picture of a uh, of a sorry, a wood mouse that was captured. And then I'm hoping that the the video will actually just show very nicely how if you capture this um, animals during the day, the perspex lid um, allows the um, a, as much light into the tunnel and this allows the animals to be recorded quite um, quite nicely. So you can record stills or you can record videos, but it's a fantastic way of actually getting some small mammal records uh, quite nicely. So I'm going to go back to bats and, uh, you know, I have to profess I'm not a bat uh, expert and we've got a uh, bat uh, members of the back group on the call here today. Um, so we obviously share data, we exchange ideas and we exchange information. Um, but what we do know from the record centre um, information is that there's a huge number of records that are just bat records. So we've got nearly 37,000 records. So almost a third of them are from, um, uh, from bat records over a number of years, it has to be said, um, but you know, th nearly 13,000 13, common pipistrelle, uh, nearly 6,000 soprano pipistrelle. So masses, masses of data there. And a lot of it has been created because of um, increases in technology. Um, the static bat detectors in particular have been fantastic in actually increasing the number of records that you can get from bats. So with that information, it's great for bats, but also there's a byproduct of um, getting all that information. And the by one of the byproducts is actually the amount of other data that's collected, a lot of which can be small mammals that are using the same areas, but not being um, taken account of. So some of the researchers began to look at this byproduct and they started to try and analyze the data using the same information that is, is done in the same way, looking at the sonograms uh, that the bats make. The, um, the small mammals were also compared. And um, you can see by the table on the right hand side that a number of species were uh, begun to be analyzed. Um, 
obviously the more recordings that they uh, they get, the better the analysis and the better way it is of defining what um, what type of animal it is. It is. So um, I just want to play you something and again, maybe a bit of audience participation to say, what do you think that uh, particular species is? Bearing in mind it is a small mammal. So I'll just play that again, just so that, you know, and I won't talk over it. So it's it's amazing, isn't it, that call? Um, it sounds like a parrot uh, to me. Um, it's actually the uh, sound of a pygmy shrew. So it's amazing that actually such a small mammal could produce such a loud sound. Um, but this type of technology is key to us understanding where pygmy shrews and, and the common shrew, the water shrew especially, could be... Um, could be recorded um, because when we try and put our traps out, our longworth traps out, then the shrew populations are actually the most vulnerable. They have such a high metabolism, they need to feed almost constantly. And if, if there's a species that is going to die in a trap, then usually it's a shrew. So using technology in this way is obviously going to be key to understanding their distribution and, uh, and to help us uh, understand how we can uh, record them more effectively. So uh, dormouse are, are dear to my heart and some of you may be aware that we've recently had a reintroduction onto the Cork Estate um, in South Derbyshire which happens to be actually within the VC55 area so I'm, I'm very keen to be involved with that. Um, and dormouse have uh, traditionally been um, recorded using citizen science and volunteers uh, so 200 boxes are put up after reintroduction. Uh, they're monitored by volunteers uh, that go around and check the boxes once a month. Uh, they record how many animals they might find in a the box. They weigh them, they sex them, they see how healthy they are. Um, and the great thing about it is that it's it's open to, to anybody as long as you've got a license hold there uh, to supervise what's going on, then it's a great way of public engagement. And it's such an endearing animal uh, that, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic experience to get involved with. Unfortunately though, when you think about where a, a nest box normally is, it's, it's put up at chest height and that's so the volunteers can get into that box and actually do the checks. Um, what it's not so good at doing is understanding where the dormouse might be in the canopy of the trees or down on the on the ground and in the field layer. So there's a whole habitat or niche habitats there that go unexplored or um, unaccounted for. And actually, if we use start to look at this sort of sonic acoustic um, information that we can use. Uh, by putting the static recorders out there, then this might actually give us a better idea of where our dormice are and how they're used in the woodlands. Um, so if we turn to a, um, a non-protected species, it should be quite a common species, the harvest mouse. And traditionally we've uh, used the techniques of looking for field signs such as the nests to find out where they are then um, really when you look at our own data for the two counties, we really just haven't got enough. So many of the speakers today have talked about tens and thousands of records that they collect, and sometimes they are tens of thousands of records that are collected annually. And you look at how many we've got. So in a five-year period, we've had 13 records of harvest mice. So really our data to use the term abysmal, I think might be too strong, but actually it's certainly not very good when we're trying to do any sort of analysis. So again, just sort of listening into what a harvest mouse sounds like. There is more. <laughs> So
So what we should be able to do with that is, again, have a look um, and listen to where the harvest mice are. Very quickly, uh, we should be able to establish just how present or absent they are in some of our reed beds and, and in some of our field margins and they help to influence how those areas can be managed. So water bells are also um, quite an important species, uh, particularly in, in the Leicestershire and Rutland area. Uh, the map on the right hand side shows Rutland water and uh, there was a, a reintroduction of water bells there uh, back in around about 2011, 2012. And that's why we've got a glut of those species there. Um, in the wider Leicestershire area, it's actually a, an interesting thing to look at waterfall records uh, because I think most people are aware that we went through a terrific loss, um, particularly along the saw catchment uh, around about the 1990s um, when they effectively disappeared. And a lot of that was down to the mink predation uh, that, that took place. So now we're beginning to see them recover, um, but they're only recovering really to the south of the city, it, it appears at the moment. So we've got good records around uh, the canals, around the Grand Union Canal and the Ashby Canal, and towards the sort of the, the southwest area of uh, the city. Um, we're hoping that we can encourage them through better habitat management to actually naturally recolonize. And we would only look at um, actually reintroducing them if it's just not possible. With the, um, with the number of records that we've got and the slow influx that we've got coming into Leicestershire, then really it just looked like uh, they could naturally um, re recolonize areas. But obviously we have to be really, really aware of any mink that might be in the area. So I'm just very quickly going to uh, play you the sound for, um, for a water bowl as well. So I have to say that sounds like a squeaky gate to me. It's it's very annoying, really, in in the way that it uh, it sounds. But again, it's it's a very quick and easy way of us establishing whether water bowls are present. Certainly, it's it's a lot less time consuming than having to go through all the habitat and actually avoiding the disturbance um, of what is quite an invasive way of actually searching for for water bowls. Um, and actually, when we correlate it with possibly um, mink presence, and we can use that same acoustic analysis, then it begins to make sense how we can take measures to control the mink. Um, and certainly with the water life trusts that are also on this call today, it's the type of thing that we want to work more closely with, uh, have more joined up thinking to see how we can safeguard uh, the water bowl in the future. Um, our records of American mink, as you can see, are very poor, they're very low, and that might be because they just aren't around. But certainly using this technology is going to help us um, understand whether they are present or absent and what we need to do about it. So what I don't want to do from this talk today is say technology is the way forward, let's let's go with that. Because I think there's always more than one way to actually get the records. Um, and certainly when Kirsty showed her slide about the reliance that we have on naturalists and recorders actually sending their data into the record center, then it makes sense that we continue to nurture uh, the people that are actually going out, the eyes and the ears and the people that want to get involved. We have to engage with people and we have to um, really raise the awareness and, and, and you know, just shout about how important it is for all our species, but in my case, particular mammals, obviously. Um, so locally, we're involved in a few projects. Uh, we will be doing the harvest mouse surveys in that traditional way. We will be looking for nests um, in the next few months. So we've got some training um, organised in various parts of Leicestershire and Rutland. 
We'll put the details up on the Nature Spot website, so do look out for those. And we hope we'll see some of you actually taking part in that. Uh, we've got the Dormouse surveys that we're doing at Cork, so we're helping out with that. It's coming to the end of the season. But again, if you do want to get in touch, you can contact the uh, Mammal Group. We can pass your details on to the National Trust and you can get involved with that. Um, and the most um, immediate thing, I guess, is, is us working on a number of uh, projects to do with water bowl conservation and uh, mink. Um, around the Leicestershire and Rutland area. So again, if you're interested in anything at all to do with that, then please do contact the Mammal Group. Um, but thank you all again for listening in, and thank you all for those of you that have contributed mammal records to Nature Spot and to the Record Centre in the last few years. And that's uh, my talk over. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Helen.